Hi, my name is Benedict for Hire Hertz. We're starting an, a new arc, just three in, in this one that's planned. We're looking at Reverb. I know I've looked at some Reverb before, but we're going to take another look at uh, Reverb and how it works, how to use it, because there's no point uh, using it not knowing how to use it, uh, and look at three specific units. We're going to start by looking at Dragonfly. Uh, all three of what we're going to look at are freebies. We try very hard to focus a lot on things that are easily accessible. Some things it's just better to, to focus on the things that are, are highest quality, which will mean cost. But there are things that are definitely workable, that are definitely low price or free, so long as you use them right. Uh, there's a lot of pressure always to the idea that, well, you can only do it if you've got and that really annoys the patootie out of me because it's just not true. Getting some magical plug-in with some magical abilities is not going to suddenly make your music better. Learning how to do it will make it better, um, as will uh, having a better washing machine because I've got the greasy stains on my Maiden t-shirt. <laughs> anyway, moving forward to things that matter, like reverb. So we're looking at Dragonfly Room to start us on the process of how reverb works. Let's take a quick AB of reverb, not reverb. Here is a mix. We take out reverb, there's a very noticeable difference in the body of this track. Now, when I said it's a mix, I don't think it's a particularly good mix uh, because I've actually pulled out some really important things, but we're going to add them in later as I talk to you about mixing and using reverb. Now, someone did say to me, oh, but, you know, you use the same tracks over and they're boring to listen to and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I get you. I do. A, listening to the same thing for hours on end, well, that's that's the job of a mix engineer. If you want the job of a mix engineer, either because you're not prepared to hire a mix engineer or because you want to become a mix engineer, that's part of it. If you find that that's too odious, that's a thing you're going to have to look at. Uh, but I am aware that I use the same fragments of non-cool pieces of music that I've made. There are two issues. One is that it can be tricky that... Um, videos like this can be taken down. You know, if I could be mixing Hotel California or something amazing, I would, but I can't. Uh, it's got, the video is going to be taken down. The other issue is that um, it's very hard to get acts to actually allow their material to be mixed or shown in public in anything other than its perfect mastered form, which is just a crying shame. Remember, I did do the vocal tutorial using one of Jake's tracks, uh, but I can't keep asking Jake to use all of his tracks over and over again. So I'm going to say, if you think that it's a little dull that we use these track fragments that I've put together for training, I fully get it, then send me some of your music. Um, preferably something that's broad enough for most people to be able to learn from um, and decent enough quality. We will need the multi-tracks with no effects. Everything's going to have to be um, drier than a desert. Otherwise, I'm just not going to be able to use it. Plus, you have to promise that it's whitelisted, meaning that th the videos for higher hertz can't get pulled down at some stage in the future when some bot gets excitable going, Ooh, this is... so there is a process under which you can whitelist our use of the track, uh, in which case I'm delighted to do that because um, what's better than using listeners' material? But there is a process which means that we need to get the multi-tracks, we need clear permission and if you're going through any kind of distribution service, uh, whether that be an official label um, or just uh, some sort of distro to get yourself on Spotify, you must whitelist our videos. Otherwise, you're just going to cause our videos to come down and we will uh, not be happy with you. Right, moving forward. So we can hear that there's a difference when we put reverb in. Let's have a bit of a primer on what reverb really is. We've heard how it can add body to our mix. I've got three slides which I shall pop up. I don't want to use my mouse as I'm using slides that I can't see right now. Reverb is a result of a sound 
which we could call an impulse, something that propagates in the space in which this event has happened. So first thing is we put sand into a room and we see that sand, or we don't see sand at all, but in the, in the, the image we see that sand propagate from the event off towards the walls. Because if there are no walls, there is no space. But there's always something to create a bounce back. If we stand on the edge of the Grand Canyon and shout Canyon, we know that it's only a matter of time before we hear Canyon, 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 come back. So even in the open world, uh, as long as we're not in outer space, something's going to bounce back from somewhere. We're going to have a sense of space. So the sound travels from the event to the walls and then comes back. The first comeback is pretty noticeable. Canyon, canyon, canyon. But then it gets more complex after that because it hits the wall and comes back. Then it hits other walls. So not only is the first sound hit the wall and bounce back, but the bounce backs hit the wall or other walls and bounce back. And that becomes more and more complex. So if we're looking at that concept of standing over the Grand Canyon and going, Canyon, the first return, early reflection, is pretty clear. It's a little mushy compared to the original, but it's pretty clear. It's very recognizable. But over time, it becomes mushier and mushier. I can't do it because obviously I can't mushy my voice in that way. But we hear that with reverb. And these are fundamental things to, to get an understanding of. What's happening there is that we've got a discrete object that leaves the event, hits the wall, and bounces back a little different. So it's become a little furrier. Once it bounces off the second wall, it becomes furrier again. And because it's not as simple as one discrete event, it's lots of events all coming together, we end up with a very furry object indeed, which is our reverb sound. That's the sound of our room. Now, the way that the sound has behaved in that room is a result of the room, of the properties of that room. So if we're standing on the Grand Canyon, we will get a very different result from if we're in, say, this room here, which also makes me go forward to say to all those people who think that recording should be done with your head in a cupboard or with one of those absurd, insulting curved shield thingies. Maybe I'll put a picture of one up. Um, you're creating a super weird room. If your song is about Harry Potter living in a cupboard, by all means, record that vocal in a cupboard. But if your song is not meant to sound like it's weirdly trapped in a strange little room, do not go recording either with strange shields or in with your head in a cupboard. Doesn't matter how many rugs you use, the weirder you create a room, the more that sound will come back. With reverb, with artificial reverb, we're just trying to duplicate the feel. Now, some people go, but it's never good enough. Uh, nothing about recorded music is real. Everything about recorded music is illusion. Right now, you are experiencing the illusion of watching me in my grease-stained Iron Maiden t-shirt explain reverb to you. You're taking it in as though I'm actually sitting here doing this, but it's all illusion. Your brain's putting it all together from what we call cues, marker points. So forget the idea of reality. What we do is we want to create the illusion for the listener and putting in an artificial reverb will help create the illusion that the listener is looking for. The advantage of using an artificial reverb is that we can have a lot more control over how this goes than if we were to simply send somebody out to stand in supposedly the perfect room. All right, let's look at Dragonfly. Dragonfly is a pretty common name that you will see when somebody starts asking for free or cheap reverbs. It's actually a collection of devices that's put together from various different sources. They're all put together by the one fellow whose name is not on the site, so I am sorry, I've forgotten it. I wish I'll try and pop it up. 
Um, he offers them, they're, they're really sort of a, a project where he wanted to do it and good on him. He's taken the, the ideas of reverb and code from a few different places and put them into an early reflections model. Remember that being the first bits that bounce back, the first one or two canyons that come back when we stand over the Grand Canyon. A plate, which is literally a piece of metal, a metal plate that we'd feed sound into and then tap, tap what comes back off the vibrations of that plate. Sounds awful, sounds great. A room which is literally like what I'm in and a hall which is obviously quite similar to a room but larger and has more emphasis on being longer on one end than another. They tend to behave differently. Other options that you will find but not in the Dragonfly uh, box are things like arenas and chambers and what have you but fundamentally these are the the spaces that we would look at i'm not going to look at all the options i've just picked out the room as being the best training basic but by all means scoot over have a play with them they are free they don't look like they're ever going to be anything but free he does accept donations or you can actually go and buy a t-shirt with dragonfly on it which obviously i would manage to somehow put grease all over uh so support where you're getting value and if you like these reverbs i think they can do you very well uh there's there's plenty to recommend in them let's look at the doohickey yourself so let's go a b again no reverb reverb Remember, I'm in cans. Reverb and cans is a really poor combination. So I'm probably going to overdo this or underdo it or whatever reverbs. I'm not going to say to you this is how it should sound, but just to give you the concept of how it works. Let's look through the device. It is a little bit on the complex looking, um, which is a shame because reverb is complex. When you try to reduce it, it becomes, I wasn't going to use the word, but I actually am going to use the word, it becomes asinine. In other words, it becomes dumb. Uh, you dumb it down very quickly, so much that it becomes pointless. And I get the idea of one of the things that was put forward for this was a one knob reverb. You've got this one knob and a just wet dry balance and, and that was supposedly the best intro reverb for anybody. I think it's probably the worst intro reverb for anybody. Didn't even listen to how it sounds. So it's not about whether it sounds any good or not. It's about if you're trying to understand reverb, you can't understand anything from the one knob. Okay, yeah, I guess maybe you can understand the balance between wet and dry. But <laughs> if you can't understand that balance already, there's not a lot of hope for you. So no one knob reverbs. I don't encourage them. Um, if you want to be lazy, fine. If you're not doing the real mix, you're just doing a, a guide and you can hand it to a real mix engineer. Use not one knob everythings. But if you're wanting to learn to be an engineer, avoid one knob everythings. So we will start just with the mix. We've got various sliders. One of the difficulties with this is that there isn't an easy wet dry. Dry being the unaffected signal, wet being the affected signal, and the balance being well, the balance thereof. If we pull down all of these and press play, we got nothing. Okay, things kept Captain Obvious, but it's important. There's our dry level. It sounds no different. Brilliant, that's exactly what we should have. We've then got the ability to dial in the, uh, the reverb level. This doesn't give us a simple wet signal, dry signal. It separates the wet signal out, which is in some ways good, but in some ways a little harder to use. So we've got early level, early reflection level. They're those first one, maybe two canyons that come back. So they will sound pretty clear and pretty clean. We've then got the late level, which is what we think of as reverb. That's the, the washy, mushy, sort of a sound with reverb will be well early early digital reverbs tend to only have late they should be very fair the first ones were a lot of almost more like early if you look at um hertz delay which is free um and that can do early reflection type 
reverbs, and that can be truly beautiful. Uh, but this is the their early reflection thing, and then the late level. So a combination of the two. will give us a fuller, richer sound. You can hear straight away as it comes in, everything suddenly becomes, ooh, and that's great. And it's not super well used here as well. This also allows you to send the early reflections into the late reflections. This reverb creates its early reflections, creates its late reflections separately from one another. I question the wisdom of that myself, but it is a it is a process. Uh, it then allows you to feed the results of the early reflections to drive late reflections as well. And so the problem is solved. If it's like this, I think they're gonna sound a little bit separated from each other. If you've got some kind of balance thereof, I'm all for it. How you balance early and late Yes, we can try to say, oh, well, the earliest ones would be the loudest and the late ones would be the quietest. Um, okay, but that's really not the way to do it. You get your mix and you work out what belongs, what sounds and feels like it's creating the impression of the space in which you want this song to be perceived to be happening. Remember, it's all illusion. So the reverb allows you to create the illusory space in which you want people to feel like this song is happening. If it's a jazz song, would you have people feel like it was happening in a tiny metal box? I hear plenty of people do it, but it's not a wise solution because people will feel like there's a disconnect there. All right, we're creating our space. So we start, we created our levels. Now let's look into how reverb itself gets created. We'll pull back the drive for now so that we can really focus on hearing our reverb. But we'll actually, we'll look at some presets here. I'm not a fan of presets, but a lot of people are. So we can hear different and the thing I want you to hear here is not that there is a good reverb there is no such thing as a good or a bad reverb uh, but just how these different spaces change the impact of the music that you're listening to. If you like it, you might go, that one's good. But that one's good for this piece. It may not be good for another piece. Some of these are now getting probably too big for this piece. Oh, oh it's on the bottom of that. That one stood out. If I were only able to use presets, which I do not do, uh, then I probably would settle on that as being, oh, at least in my cans, sounds like it really brings a lot more um, oomph, body and sparkle to the whole piece. But we're not going to be working from, uh, from presets. We're going to be working from the beginning. Uh, so let's get rid of all of this stuff. Uh, decay, pretty low size, width, we will leave that there. So, back to a zeroed reverb. There's no real way to zero this plugin. And pull back our drive. We're not hearing an awful lot because our decay is awfully short. So let's pull this up to long. It's long and massively over over mixed, but this is again so you can really hear what's going on. We start with the size of the room. Oh, you will, if you hadn't already noticed, there is this visualizer, which is part of the reason I chose this to start with, is that it gives you a little bit of a sense of what's going on. If you're not used to this sort of thing, you might be confused by what you're looking at. This is showing you in this dimension, the time. See, I chose two seconds, so it's like, yeah, 
It's about two seconds long. In the manual, it says this is the amount of time it takes the um, late level to be minus 60 dB from where it started. So if it starts at 0 dB, it will be minus 60 dB at this point. If it starts at minus 10, then it'll be at minus 70 at this point. So it's just a fall off rate. So this is showing us kind of how it sounds. It's also showing us in the frequency range how much activity we have in the low frequencies, the mid frequencies, the high frequencies. Now we can hear with size that we've now got quite discrete echoes. So that the drums in particular start to sound a little bit rattly because our walls are further away. Therefore, it's more noticeable the time in which the bounce backs occur, as in canyon, 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 big gap. Whereas if it was Harry Potter's cupboard, we wouldn't actually hear any bounce back as such. We just have this funny sort of sense in our ears of like, oh, uh, we feel a little funny. It's because a bounce back is so fast that it's doing weird things in our head. We could get into what that's doing, but that's just wasting our time here. So size roughly approximates the size of the room. 32 meter room is pretty big for a room, not that great for a hall, but it's big enough for us to hear that kind of cluttery thing, particularly from the drums. If we go shorter, eight meters is still fairly big. Three eighths is 24 foot, um, give or take. As we get out to here, we start to go, oh yeah, that's a fairly comfortable sort of space. It's, it's big and it's getting a little slushy. We then have decay. We've already looked at this a little bit. We can say, how long does our echo last? And hear how that just turns into kind of a white noise, a towards the end. That's a useful thing in reverb or a terrible thing in reverb. Depends on what you're trying to achieve. Just watch that you don't end up with reverbs that are too long, or you can start to have some difficulties with that. There's also the ability to have pre-delay. Pre-delay in this plugin only works on the late reflection, so it won't affect the early. So you can hear a slap back. Now some rooms, particularly halls, do that very noticeably. Basketball court, uh, enclosed basketball court, bounce the ball, kind of nothing, and then suddenly poof, it comes back at you. That's called a slap back. Pre-delay sounds like a thing you don't want to use, but it allows you to balance early and late. And it also allows you to move that reverb away from the initial sound. You don't notice it there, but here. Yeah, we've got a greater feeling of space. So it's like we've moved from a smallish room to a basketball court. It also allows, as long as we're not using too much, to separate the reverb a little from the event, giving us a bit more clarity. At the moment, this is getting mushy. Allows us to have a little bit more sense of space. We're overdoing this, especially with the thing done. So not only can we use pre-delay to create a, big, a sense of a bigger space, but to separate the event from its, its late reverb or reverb in general to give a little bit more clarity here. So long as what's happening here is not messing up the next event, then we're actually really winning with that. But they're your main controls. What happens after is where 
we separate one reverb from another to a great extent. Oh, there's width, which is the stereo-ness from... This doesn't go to full mono. I kind of get its point why it wouldn't, but I, I think why not offer it? Seeing you've got the knob go from zero, which is a full mono reverb, which can be really useful, especially at an instrument level, if you're using that to then feed a room reverb, out to 150%. Now, I've spoken on this and I'll speak on it again. Be very careful while tempting to say, oh, I want this to be as wide as possible. I want it to be like 300% wide because wide is better, man. No, it's not. Wide just makes things sound weird. Uh, this, is, this is why um, punk, early rap, all this kind of stuff was mixed very solidly in the center with a little bit on the sides because it provides this really muscular punch. So if you're not sure, leave it 100%. If you feel like it, whatever you're doing is just a bit, oh, and bring it back. Hear how, even though we're horribly mixed here, this helps provide focus. This helps provide mess. The reverb, seeing it's over stereoed, starts to overawe the core material. Yes, if we were mixed a little bit better. Bit of stereo is nice. But even there, at least in cans, this over stereo sounds creepy. It sounds like it's been turned inside out. You do not want to do that. If you're having issues and you feel like that's the right reverb balance, everything else is right, but it's still like not sitting right, try pulling it in a little bit. At least in cans, that 80% sounds much better than 100% because it's not fighting out on the sides there. We get into these functions. When we have a very long room in particular, hear how we can hear that rattle of all the individual echoes coming back. If we add diffusion. It simply changes that relationship. How they do it gets complex. Different programs will handle it different ways. Some will add in more delays to even it out. So rather than hearing tap, 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 you're hearing tap, 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 tap. And that, as you hear, starts to turn into one tap word rather than tap, tap, tap. That's one way to create more diffusion, more, more echoes happening in that space to fill it out. The other is to use all pass filters which smear everything around. This is using the all pass filter method and it smears things around which can make it better or it can make it worse. It does sound more smeary. Which is better for you is entirely up to you. I'm not a massive fan of the all pass method. Uh, but it serves a purpose. So diffusion is merely trying to spread out those tap, 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 like canyon, 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 and turn it into a whoo, because that's perceived to be what people want in reverb. We've then got this spin and wander. Very strange names, and I don't know why they chose them, because this is a chorus. It's very common to put some kind of pitch shifting or chorusing inside a reverb unit because, and go into the emptiest room in your house, uh, one with little to no furniture. The bathroom might work, but often doesn't work very well because you've got a lot of extra walls. You're looking for an empty space, particularly empty up towards the ceiling. Clap your hands as loud as you can, just once. And you should hear from particularly the corners or where the ceiling and the wall meet, this kind of whining sound. Because what's happening is your clap's gone out and it's propagated around the room and the room is so small that it's actually starting to flange, to phase and flange. So you get this whining sound because it's literally the same sound on top of itself. Therefore, you're getting all kinds of phase cancellations. It whines. So spin is the chorus rate. So this is how fast the chorus oscillates. And wander is how far it allows this to move. What the oscillator form here is, I don't know whether it's a perfect um, sine wave or whether it is a noise-based or, or, or non 
non-perfect kind of wander, in which case the terms make a bit more sense. But you hear how, as we add this up, we get a richer sound. This is pretty subtle in, in what it does, uh, but nonetheless, a little bit of movement will mean that you get, uh, you, you transition from separate taps that start to whine and give that weird metallic sound ringing into something that's softer, smoother, and more wah. So really common to find in reverbs. If you're using a chorus in the middle of your reverb, just be careful, and it's not an issue here as far as I can hear, just be careful that too much chorus can suddenly make that start to sound chorusy. Now, if you're doing synth music, that can be brilliant. Uh, but if you are doing uh, acoustic piano playing Chopin with uh, a guitarist playing, um, playing who's, who's a famous guitar composer? I have no idea. Isn't that terrible? Um, but you know, let's say that this is purist kind of stuff and you will need to use a reverb. You most likely will. Chances of you getting, unless you're in a beautiful room with beautiful mics, chances are you are going to use a reverb to impart the feeling of what people you want people to feel. But do you want them to feel like, oh, this is retro wave, dude, or do you want them to feel like they're listening to, to Chopin, nicely performed with an acoustic piano in some sort of, you know, what to them feels like a nice space, along with John Williams plucking his guitar. The guitar playing John Williams, not the boom, 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 boom kind of John Williams. Confusing. I know, very complex. But that adds an extra layer of volume depth. So it's a pretty important thing. Don't underdo it, or you start to get metallic ringing. Don't overdo it, or you start to get a chorusy sound to things. Which, as I said, if you're doing pop, synth music, what have you, that chorusy sound can be really important. I use it a lot in things, but I don't use reverbs that sound like this anywhere near as much as other people do, and I'll show you part of how and why later. We've then got tone controls. They're a kind of EQ. We've got a high cut. The high cut allows us to, across the board, roll off. You can see it happens here. So that's made our room a lot darker. Too dark. That's very bright. We can shave a bit off. We've then got what's called damping. Damping is very, very related to the cut process that we've just seen. Damping means that every time our sound bounces back off something, not all of it comes back, which we've spoken about. Now, if that something is a furry wall, Go watch um, Get Him to the Greek, Hug the Berry Wall. Then what comes back is definitely not the same as what went out. The furry wall will not reflect all of the frequencies equally. A lot of high frequency will be lost in the fur. Therefore, we get some kind of damping. If we pull out our lights and just have our early, let's see what we get. Again, we can hear it get darker. And then we do the same to the to the lights. possibly a little large at the moment. So by defining how the room feels in terms of how it's handling the top end, we get a more natural sound. It also dies off 
a little fast. As you saw before, our two seconds was a bit excessive. Now, we feel like it's getting out of the way a little quicker. Which means if we wanted longer reverb, we can actually increase our time without quite so much clutter. Now the low cut is obviously the same as the high cut, only it's working on the bottom end of the mix. This, I think, does require a fair amount of care. Often people use reverb because it suddenly fills out the bottom of their mix. It's like, oh, but at the same time, it creates mud. You can hear here, there's a fair amount of mush in here. So we want to lift that. This only goes up to 200 hertz. I, I would like for it to go a lot higher than that. I really would. Uh, but the, the maker of this has obviously liked the idea, as you'll see with the next thing we look at, of using reverb to oomphify the, 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 the belly of the room. Uh, but if we use a higher low cut, as if we can cut more, then we can get a surprisingly bright room. If we put back our... You know, it's a bit... I'm not saying this is right or wrong, but you can hear a little bit of wood in the bottom. Up here. Suddenly it's clearer. Which means that we could actually put more of everything in. Bit gluggy. Clearer. What's right or wrong is not a case of what's right or what's wrong. Remember, this is illusion. You're looking to create the feeling that you want. What, what space are we in? If it was a super shiny space, we're going to end up with a very bright room. And that's going to put a lot of sparkle on things. And that can be good until it becomes like putting, as I said, a lot of low end in can become problematic in that, uh, yes, we get lots of this feeling of whoomp, a whoomp, a whoomp, a whoomp. But how much do you enjoy listening to some homie sub or the neighbor from four houses over when they're watching movies with their sub turned up to 11? How much do you enjoy the content of what they're into? Because it's just like... <laughs> which is not quite the same as, you know, the whole process. So work your balances carefully. The next feature... Uh, the developer has seen the need for it. I'm not sure that I love it, but we'll go over it. If you're looking to make your room feel fuller in the bottom end, you can add this low boost. A low boost is how much, it's essentially a low shelf, how much boost we're using on that shelf EQ. It doesn't tell us what its numbers are. And then we can choose the upper frequency. So that's the point at which if we had a shelf EQ, we would say, well, in this case, at 700 hertz, I want to raise by X number of dB everything below that. And you can hear a difference. Not only does it extend what's happening here, uh, well, he does say it extends these lower frequencies, but I assume that it extends it through EQ. Um, there are other ways to do it, but I don't think anybody was using them at the time that this was created. So chances are it's EQ. You can see these frequencies here get longer. Oh, on the... You hear it go, and, and that's nice. You've just got to really be kind of aware of what you're doing. Because you can end up with a room that's too... But if you get it right, then it's going to come in really quite nicely. So if we pull our reverb back a little bit to be sane, still probably overmixed, can't tell in these things. But we have now created a nice, quite large, quite warm room 
in which our performance has occurred. At this point, I'll run through my good and bad on uh, on this particular device. Remember, I haven't looked at the other devices. I, I, I launched them sort of so, okay, this one does this, this one does this, this, and the room struck me as the perfect way to, to start to introduce these concepts. So that's why this was chosen, not about the others at all. What is good? It is pretty adaptable. Uh, he's obviously given us a fair number of parameters to control the um, the shape, size, tone, what have you, of our room that we're creating. The ability to mix is also pretty good as well. The display showing us the is is pretty cool. As a learning device, it does help you visualize a little bit of what's happening. It's a novelty, and you should be relying far more on your ears, but being able to correlate with, oh, what I hear is that, as in we boosted that low, and then we could actually see the low um, move further in the graph, that's, that's not entirely a bad thing to do. So infographics that are live and interactive, pretty darn useful, especially at the price. It is free. There is nothing asked other than perhaps to make a donation or buy a dragonfly reverb shirt. Um, that's cool. And as I've said in other videos, if you're getting value out of this, you really should support the people who brought that value. That's called supporting your backline. If you support a backline, your backline will then support you. No, that doesn't mean that, uh, keep thinking his name's Michael, doesn't mean that Michael's going to come out and, and support you. But it means that if you have a culture of never giving anything, then it means that when it comes time to singing songs, you're not really giving them to your fans. You're not giving your fans an amazing experience. You're just saying, give me plays, give me likes, give me money. I see those kinds of posts online all day. Those people don't go anywhere at all. So it's free, but make sure that you add value somewhere. The, the bads, it is complex. But as I said before, to be fair, the idea of going, oh, well, I'll, I'll do my reverb with a one knob is to me stupid, it's asinine, it's dumb, because you're refusing to learn your craft. Again, if you are only doing um, guide mixes um, or song demos that doesn't matter much what they sound like, then yeah, use whatever, doesn't matter, because you're going to go to a professional who's going to use better pieces of kit to do this. And I'm not saying better devices as such, but just that have more control uh, than this one knob, you know, if I went to um, to somewhere and found that the guy was just using a one knob, unless I knew the guy was already doing stellar work, I'd probably be like, oh no, oh no. Um, doesn't matter how many degrees he's got, if he's not turning out good work because he doesn't know how to make a reverb, he's not getting my job. Uh, the wet dry, I am going to raise. Apart from all the general complexity, which you do have to understand, but given time, if you think about it carefully, follow what I've discussed and try it yourself. Don't leave it till you get into a mix and then go, oh, 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 what did he say? What am I supposed to put that knob to? There is no supposed to. You sit down with something and you keep working at it until you go, oh, that sounds like this kind of a space. Oh, that sounds like that kind of a space. You're creating a whole lot of understanding for yourself that when you get sent a jazz piece, you can go, I remember how I got a jazzy-ish kind of a room, and then you start to dial in the real thing based on your understanding. Um, but the, a, the, the dry, wet thing is difficult because it's nice that it is separated, but there's no simple A, B thing. And of course, there's no bypass on board. Um, it, it's a little pedantic, but if you are learning, it's a little harder to get a simple sense of what if I pull all the, all the reverb down, because you've got to pull these down separately from each other, which means that they're never going to be quite the same. Yes, if you're in a, a situation that you have macros like Reason with its combinator, um, then that's relatively easy to make, but then you, you're asking somebody to work outside your device as well as inside your device. So it's it's sort of a big deal, really. It really is sort of a big deal if we're looking at it from a learner's perspective. However, we can argue that by having to do these manually every single time, perhaps the person's going to get a bigger understanding of the difference between early reflections, the first canyon that comes back, and the later reflections being the canyon, 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 that come back. 
it, it wouldn't stop me from using the device. It's just one of those things that I noted. Now let's turn this off because adding reverb in the masters, while it is a thing, I'm going to say that's not what we want to do at all. Let's get that out of the way. So we're going to dry. Now this this part you don't have to watch, but this is how to use a reverb, and it's it's pretty darn important. Reverb is generally done on a send. I do see people putting a different reverb on every single instrument, like put a reverb on my drums, put a reverb on my bass, put a reverb on my guitar line, on my other guitar line, put a reverb on my synth. And now what we've done is we've put each of those devices into a different room. That's kind of not the way it's supposed to go. Remember when you listen to a song, you're listening to one song. You're not listening to 47 different instruments in different places and different times. Even if it was something recorded that during the pandemic where everybody's in their little window, it should not feel like that. It should feel like one song. We are the world. We are the children. It's 300 rock stars who look like they only just crawled out of bed, um, because that's true in a lot of the cases, um, in one room. It's one song. So use a send. It's up to you how to, to learn how to use your door, but you will generally have a send system that will come back in on some kind of a return. It's not always wise in Dorville to bring that back in on another channel because you can actually mess up the way that um, the system works. So you can end up with plug-in delay issues. So you can actually then start to have your timings feel funny, not to mention build in some kind of phasing or flanging problem. That shouldn't be a big issue with reverb, but generally use the send and return system as set up by your door, because that's how it's designed to work. If you feel like you want to put something between the reverb and the return, then just use your door system to insert something. Like if I wanted to insert an EQ or a compressor post reverb, then I would just make sure it was wired send to reverb which would look like this, send to reverb. I would then have audio out, not going to here, but audio out going to say EQ device, audio out from EQ device going to effects return one. That is how you set it up. You then make sure that when you open your device that the dry level is nothing, zero. Otherwise you are returning the signal that you are sending. Let's have a look, listen, and see to that. We're going to listen to just this return. So we're just hearing reverb. If it was sending this back, we're changing our levels, and that's just not the way it's supposed to be done. So return only wet. How you set this up is sort of up to you. I'm prone to doing a combination of things. I will st set my sends, which is here. Now you'll notice I haven't put a send on every track here. These are the desk tracks. Now drums, bass, and rhythm. Drums and bass, these are tracks where rhythm is a bus. I have sent my drums and bass to the rhythm bus, meaning I can hear both of them in the one spot. So if I send here and here, in some doors, if I mute this, I will still be hearing my sends. I mean, that, that to me is very weird, but it is possible that we can have issues. The idea of bussing a signal is to say, I'm going to turn these into one. So I turn my drum and bass into one, it's a rhythm section, and I might have compressed or something, I haven't done anything here, but if I have done some compression, then we want the reverb to reflect the compressed version, or the EQ'd version, or the whatever we have done at the bus. If we send here, then our reverb's not going to match what people are hearing. And that's just mental. There are times when you want to do that, when you want to sound like really kooky and weird, uh, but 
we want people to hear what matches what they're hearing. So we will send from the bus, same here. My guitar's not being sent, but the guitars are put in a bus, so we send from the bus. The synth doesn't have anything else happening, so it's sent from the synth. That's it. That's the way it works. That is how you set things up. Now, I set that up really early, and Reason is wonderful because it defaults to minus 12 dB. So whenever I start a send, you can see it's already at minus 12 dB. A lot of doors will default to a full 0 dB send. Your business, but I do find that a lot harder. Uh, some doors will allow you to define what value that goes out at, in which case I would recommend defining that as minus 12 dB, or something that isn't minus 0 dB, because then if you decide, oh, I want my synth to have more reverb, then you're pushing above the 0 dB. In digital, it sort of doesn't matter, but you're creating a whole other issue. Create your line in the sand, and minus 12 dB is a great line in the sand. If we want that to have more reverb on it, then we've got another 12 dB of send for our reverb, which is more than enough, like more than enough. Um, so that's how you set up your send, and when it comes back, simple as that. Hopefully you have a mute on that, and we can turn it off. Some systems allow you to hear only the reverb, some don't. This one does, that's how you do it. Reverb. So that's our thing. Now we're not looking to make the most obvious reverb possible. We're looking to create a feeling, okay, where do I think I want this to take place? I don't want my drums to seem as reverby as everything else because it creates mush. This allows me to push a little bit more reverb in general. So I'm going to pull that back to minus 15, minus 18 dB. Safe numbers to use, you do it by ear. If I'm creating my reverb outside here, I might put this in and create a sense of, oh, okay, that's sort of how it goes, but I don't try to set my levels here. I will largely have those pretty darn high. So my levels are then set through how I'm sending and returning. It's possible sometimes you can just have too much reverb in which case, you can finesse that here. I'm probably going to have too much reverb because I'm working in cans. But for now, that sounds okay. That is how you set up reverb. I do that before I start most of the rest of the mix. Before I'm going in and going and EQing and this, that and the other, I set up the space. I go, how do I want this to feel? Most often I do that with the vocal because the vocal is the lead part of this thing. And so the lyric is the most important, so I make sure that the lyric is going to be moving in a very, very nice room that's well suited to it. I know people go, oh, well, I create my vocal reverb and then I create my music reverb. And again, it's just like, you're feeding me two pieces of information at once. The vocal's in one place, the music's in a whole other room. Not a good plan, you need one room, so I have one reverb. Sometimes I will have two or three reverbs. Uh, Jake's album, Falling Down in Love, there's commonly two reverbs at least. Uh, and I may push a little more to one, one vocal into one and a little more music into the other. But 
the difference is relatively small, but by having two reverbs together, often because I use much sparser reverbs, but the two reverbs together, you end up with a tremendously thick, rich sound. And that's important, really important. I hear far too many mixes where there is little to no reverb, or worse, there's little to no delay. So what a lot of people don't think about is that reverb itself is only half of the equation. Yes, it's a nice half. But this mix still sends, sounds rather flat and papery. There, there is no real beauty in this mix. Because what I did was I turned off the echoes. Now let me turn on, let's just take this guitar. Now let's turn on its echo. Apart from making the piece more interesting. Notice how it has a lot more richness and body and space. Let's bring in this one too. Now these echoes are the beginnings of reverb. They are that first canyon that comes back. And we use those, a good mix engineer uses those to put the instrument somewhere in the room and to feed the reverb. I don't expect the reverb to do all its work on its own, which is part of why I tend to use quite sparse reverbs. Um, I didn't realize it, but I'm really an early reflections guy. I remember we're reading about it in the early days where people were suddenly, well, oh, early reflections, and thinking, that's stupid, I want reverb, early reflections, that's for weaklings. And then I realized, no, I'm actually an early reflections guy, and I use a lot of loose, rattly kinds of reverbs, but they're fed by a lot of echoes here, so I'm creating what other people would mistakenly do with a reverb here. And if it works for you, great. I'm not having a go at anybody, especially if somebody is successful. You know, if Andrew Sheps comes to me and goes, well, I put reverbs in there, you're saying I'm an idiot. No, I'm not saying you're an idiot, Andrew, at all. I'm saying this is how I do it, and here's the logic for it. Um, I doubt that Andrew would behave that way, because I think he's a lot more mature than that. Um, Will Smith, on the other hand. Uh, no, I, I, I actually think that Will was justified in the old because Chris was being a dill. So we add in our echoes here, which not only have helped the performance, but they add a lot more body to our track. Let's pop out a solo, and now our synth. Let's put in its echoes. That suddenly becomes so much bigger. It's big on its own. Once we put it into the reverb, yes, the synth sort of moves back a little bit, but it was forward, far too forward before. It was like, you know, sort of poking in the nose, uncomfortable, and I hear too many mixes like that. Use your echoes to put your instruments in position. So that's out, but with reverb in. That's then in. Really important, reverb on its own is not the whole thing. Everything about a mix is how everything works together. Feed your reverbs with echoes. Sometimes short reverbs I will put on things if I've got, say, an orchestral type instrument that's been recorded very dry, because that's a valid way of recording, and it's the most versatile way of recording, not the most popular way of recording, but the most, the most versatile way of recording. If it's been recorded really dry, then I might put an actual little reverb 
on the front of the instrument, then my delays and possibly even pushing all of that into some kind of compressor to pull it together, and then that goes off to the reverb. So I might have my little orchestra here to a group, whereupon the group has got a little bit of reverb, some echoes, um, some kind of compression, whatever I'm doing to turn it into one, and then that gets sent off to the reverb. But really important, use your um, echoes to push into your reverb so that you get a much nicer sound. So now we've got a reverb set up and a good sounding mix. So final words is I think that this is a, a good reverb. I think it's a pretty good learning tool, if nothing else. I, I will admit, for some reason, I don't fully love its sound, but it may be just because I haven't spent enough time with it to find the points where I like it. Uh, but I think for the price, if you're looking at reverb and wanting to understand how it works better than just wasting time with one knob and wondering why you don't get any better at it, then this is a pretty darn good place to start. If this one you don't love, then I've got two more that we're going to look at, which will be um, Oral River and Epic Verb. I have used Epic Verb in a piece recently. I have used Oral River in the past. Uh, so they're all, and if this was the only reverb I had, I would use this and I would find how to make it Benedictine. Uh, just being honest that I don't have my place as to, as to where it fits for me and what I do, but there's a lot of versatility. And again, as a training tool, there's plenty to recommend it just by understanding how tone over time gives us a very different feeling about the space that we're in, that we can define our time in several different ways on the beginning as to like the size and the properties of our room and on the end, which is the reflective properties of our room. So plenty to be going on with. And if you want to sit down and really teach yourself how reverb works, um, rather than just watching a two minute tut that says use reverb, then this is a really pretty darn good place to start. Why I chose it, sit there with a basic piece like this set it up and then work out how to make your piece feel like it's in different places and that fills up your spreadsheet of cool things that you can do now if you've got any questions uh, not about support for dragonfly please that's not uh, that's not our thing but if you've got any questions about anything that, that we've discussed here uh, then please first hit subscribe thank you hit subscribe I uh, might be an early questioner. Uh, probably not. Hit subscribe because that shows that we are doing work that's valuable, helps reward us, and ask a question. If it's uh, all about your mix, it's really important. I can't answer mixed questions if I can't hear them. And that means you've got to do a screen recording to show me what's happening uh, and not a of your camera floating in front of your screen and your speakers. I'm going to ignore that or possibly even ask for it to be deleted because it's not serious. If you're asking me a direct mix question, bear in mind, this is what I do for a living. So is that, should that be paid work? Do you want me to mix it for you? Um, but if you are asking a question and it's good for everyone to learn, then I'm more than happy to engage. Just make sure OBS, good, perfect. I need to be able to hear what's going on. If you're worried that someone's gonna steal your work, you need to get over that right now. Um, I show my work anywhere, everywhere. Have people stolen it? Mostly I don't think so, but there have been a couple of times where people have used my work and normally they've run to me and said, Benedict, look what I did. And I may feel a little bit like you, you, I probably wouldn't have asked you to do that, but I'm flattered more than insulted every time. So present, ask your question, and uh, once I'm aware of it, I will provide an answer for you. Now, the most important thing is go out there, spend some time learning. I know learning might seem boring, but the time you sit there, if if you're looking to either train yourself to be a mix engineer for your own work or to be a mix engineer in general, then that is training time. That's an investment. Uh, and whatever you're doing there, make sure that you are having fun. <laughs>